Academic Freedom Lecture Fund. She was instrumental in the creation of this lecture series and continues to be the driving force behind this major academic address at our university. Dr. Hollinsworth is a past national and local chapter president of Sigma Xi and is the founding member of the Coalition for the Advancement of Blacks in Biomedical Sciences. She also has numerous national and university honors and awards during her very successful career, including the University of Michigan, Michigan's Distinguished Faculty Governance Award. Finally, although I'm certain that Peggy will be telling you about this, I want to be sure that on behalf of the University Senate, I have the opportunity to formally thank her, President Coleman, and the past members of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund Board for all their successful work in tandem with our Board of Regents in the development of the new Davis Market Nickerson Visiting Professorship. Peggy, thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Each year for the past 14 years, I have had the privilege and the pleasure of making a few comments prior to the University of Michigan Senate's Davis Margaret Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. There are many reasons why I value this event so highly. First, the annual lecture has provided the opportunity to meet with and welcome back to Ann Arbor the noted scholars for whom the lecture series is named. Beginning with the first lecture in 1991, whenever possible, our honorees attended the events. Unfortunately, Mark Nickerson passed away in 1998 and Clement Markert in 1999. We still are honored by the presence of Chandler Davis, who this year is here with his wife, Natalie Davis, a noted historian. Chandler, will you and Natalie please stand so that we can welcome and recognize you. A dream that I have shared for some time with many here with us today has been to give a greater permanence to the lecture series by the creation of an endowed professorship in honor of Professors Davis, Marker, and Nickerson. I must confess that like many others, at time I was doubtful that this dream would ever become a reality. Some of you will recall that in 1990 when we went to the Regents with a proposal for an action of reconciliation for the manner in which the university treated the three professors during the McCarthy era, we encountered stony, cold rejection. We failed to receive any support or encouragement from university administrators. In response, the Senate Assembly passed a resolution that established the annual lecture on academic and intellectual freedom. And the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund was created to raise funds to support the lecture series. During the late 1990s, biology professor Thomas Moore, law professor and former law school dean Theodore St. Antoine and I crafted with much effort and many revisions a proposal for the creation of a Davis Market Nickerson visiting professorship. In 2000, the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs, SACUA, unanimously endorsed a motion that called for the establishment of this professorship in a timely manner so that the solicitation of funding might be part of the university's capital campaign. When Mary Sue Coleman became president of the University of Michigan, a series of meetings were arranged between her staff, other interested parties, and the proponents of the professorship. President Coleman gave us her strong support and even agreed to provide the funding for the first few years of the Davis Margaret Nickerson visiting professorship. This past spring, Provost Paul Courant and interim Rackham Graduate School Dean Stephen Kunkel took the proposal to the university's regents and at their May 2005 meeting, the regents formally established the professorship. We hope to have our campus on our campus sometime in 2006, the first visiting professor. In addition to those whose names I have already mentioned, there are so many other members of our community to be thanked for their efforts that have brought about the professorship. They include the members of the University of Michigan Ann Arbor Chapter of the American Association of University Professors, the members of directors and advisory board members of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, 
many members and chairs of SACUA, especially SACUA chairs William Ensminger, Louis DeLacy, and Charles Koopman, who participated in the conversations with the university administrators and with many others, there are too many to name today. Critical to the establishment of the Davis Mark and Nickerson Visiting Professorship have been the annual lectures themselves. Starting with our first lecture, Robert O'Neill, in 1991, and including, but certainly not an ending, with today's lecture, our speakers have brought to our campus enormous erudition and a remarkable understanding of issues related to academic and intellectual freedom. Each year, they rekindle in us a fervent desire to go out and fight for academic and intellectual freedom on our campuses and in our greater society. In, this, in his introductory comments prior to last year's lecture, Provost Paul Cremont noted that the annual Davis Market Nickerson Lecture is an extremely important event on the university calendar. How far we have come since those days in 1990 when first we approached the university administration and the regents with our requests for an act of reconciliation. Of course, there are many who work quietly behind the scenes to make possible the annual lecture. The staff of the Faculty Senate Office, Thomas Schneider and Jane Liu, with their student assistants, are an invaluable part of the process. Brent Futurell from the law school has been responsible for the imaginative posters and the program booklets in the past few years. Patrick Murphy and his staff at Biomedical Biomedical Communications have taken great care in producing accurate video recordings of these lectures so that they might become a part of our historical archives. Finally, this year's lecture has been co-sponsored by the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, the American Association of University Professors, University of Michigan Chapter, the University of Michigan Office of the President, Office of the Vice President for Communications, the University Law School, and the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs. Please forgive me if I have failed to recognize anyone. Among the distinguished panelists who participated in the 10th anniversary celebration of the Davis and Margaret Nickerson Lecture was Edward Gramlich, a governor of the Federal Reserve Board, on leave of absence from the University School of Public Policy. Professor Gramlich has now returned to our campus, and today, Professor Gramlich will introduce the 15th annual Davis Market Nickerson Lecturer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peggy. I'm pleased to be here also to welcome you to the 15th annual Davis Market Marker Nickerson Lecture at the University of Michigan. This lecture, occurring just as a new academic year hits full stride, provides us with an important opportunity to think about academic and intellectual freedom. These freedoms are fundamental to the work of, of faculty members of this university and indeed of any university in an open society. American colleges and universities have their roots in the European universities that began in the 13th and 14th centuries. While from our vantage point, the faculty in those early universities do not seem to have been particularly free to explore any line of inquiry that they chose, in the context of their own time, they were quite free and quite well protected by their universities. Since that time, the tradition of intellectual freedom has become entrenched, and not surprisingly, the argument for academic freedom has not really changed much in the intervening 700 years. Freedom of intellectual and academic inquiry is the base from which new ideas develop. It is the key to the creation of new knowledge that is fundamental to the mission of universities. Throughout history, there have been attempts to limit this freedom. As today's lecture reminds us, this actually happened here. The McCarthy era of the 1950s was a difficult time for universities and others who valued free inquiry, free expression, and freedom of association. Three Michigan faculty members, Chandler Davis, Clement Markert, and Mark Nickerson, chose to challenge the limits being placed upon them. When called to testify before the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee, they refused. 
They were courageous in their defense of a principle important to all of us. And yet the university did not support them. The three were suspended from the university. Ultimately, Professor Market was in, reinstated, but Professors Davis and Nickerson were dismissed. All three went on to very distinguished faculty careers elsewhere. But the university lost an important opportunity to defend, to, excuse me, defend values that are the foundation of our scholarly lives and critical to our democratic society. This lecture is an important annual affirmation of our commitment to make sure this never happens again. Today we are honored to have Floyd Abrams here to speak and help us reflect on these issues. Issues that while complex are essential to us as individuals and as a community. Mr. Abrams is a leading advocate of First Amendment rights. Some of us with more gray hairs will remember that he, the important role that he played as co-counsel to the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case of the 1970s. More recently, he has represented both television and radio networks in cases challenging secrecy in government, and he represented Senator Mitch McConnell and the National Associ Association of Broadcasters in a First Amendment-based uh, challenge to the constitutionality legislation on campaign finance. Mr. Abrams recognizes that threats to our essential freedoms can come from either side of the political spectrum. His commitment is to the defense of rights, no matter where the challenge arises. For this, we are very much indebted to him. Floyd Abrams is a recipient of numerous awards for his contributions to the defense and discussion of our rights. He is a frequent commentator on television news programs as well. A graduate of Cornell University and the Yale University Law School, he is currently a partner in the New York law firm of Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell. He is also the William J. Brennan, Jr. Visiting Professor of First Amendment Law at, the, at Columbia University uh, Graduate School of Journalism. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Abel. It's all very imposing. I'm trying to find a place where you won't get the hum uh, in the background. Uh, it's delightful for me to be here, and I'm very honored to be here, particularly in the presence of Professor Davis himself. Uh, the notion of having a celebration, in a sense, uh, of the First Amendment uh, by having a lecture series of this sort and having a uh, finally a uh, faculty position uh, arising out of this uh, is uh, unique to this university uh, and uh, I'm especially honored to have the chance to appear here today to, to talk about a few issues relating to academic freedom uh, and to uh, another subject which uh, I thought I would raise first really because it is newsworthy uh, and because I thought you might be interested in it. Uh, I've been spending much of my time in the last uh, few months uh, representing Judith Miller uh, and uh, since the time has come that uh, she is finally uh, out of prison, uh, I thought it might be of interest to you if I started out at least by way of introduction uh, by offering a few answers, maybe, to some questions that I've been asked around campus today and elsewhere, such as, what about Robert Novak? <laughs> why, why is he walking the streets freely? Uh, to which the answer is, I don't know. Uh, 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 all we do know is this. Uh, uh, when Mr. Novak published his article, uh, which criticized uh, 
uh, former Ambassador Joseph Wilson, who had written an article, an op-ed piece in the New York Times, which in turn had criticized President Bush. Uh, Novak's article, uh, in an effort to diminish Wilson uh, and to respond to Wilson saying, uh, I went to Niger uh, at the request of the CIA to find out if it was true that Saddam Hussein had sought to purchase uranium from that country. I made a report to the CIA basically saying that I found no support for that. Nonetheless, President Bush in his 2003 State of the Union message said that according to British intelligence, Saddam Hussein had sought to purchase uranium from that country. So he wrote this op-ed piece, and the answer uh, to him, as initially provided in the Novak column, essentially said, don't pay any attention to this guy. He says he went to Niger on behalf of the CIA. Uh, George Tenet doesn't know who he is. Uh, and if you really want to know, he went on behalf of his wife because his wife is a CIA operative and she's the one that arranged the whole thing. Now, I suspect that neither Mr. Novak knew nor his sources knew that uh, it can easily be a crime for someone in the executive branch of government to leak the fact that uh, a, a continuing CIA agent who is still undercover and who the government is making efforts to protect the secrecy of her relationship to the CIA to leak the fact of her CIA affiliation. Uh, Novak's article, uh, based on whatever, whoever his sources were, uh, did reveal uh, uh, Valerie Plame's uh, continuing relationship with the CIA, uh, and an investigation began. Uh, the investigation, uh, grand jury investigation, headed by, uh, ultimately, by the U.S. attorney uh, from Chicago, Patrick Fitzgerald. Uh, and everyone has wanted to know, since it all happened because of Novak, uh, que pasa? Uh, and the answer is, as I've told you with great candor, I have no idea. Uh, but the only answer that makes sense, the only answer, is that Novak has testified. And either with or without his sources, consent uh, revealed the identity uh, of his sources. The special counsel has already advised the court on more than one occasion that with the uh, uh, testimony that has just occurred of Judith Miller, uh, he's finished with his uh, uh, work in terms of gathering information. Uh, we should know by the end of this month whether there will be any indictments, and if so, what charges are brought. Uh, but in, in terms of Novak, it is conceivable we will never know, uh, uh, quite literally, uh, because unless the special counsel, counsel issues a report uh, telling us uh, uh, matters of this sort, uh, and I doubt that this would be in it at any event. Uh, even if there are indictments, uh, there might be no uh, further uh, knowledge on our part. But I think a working hypothesis we can operate on uh, is that uh, he did testify. What about Judith Miller? You, you have been reading about uh, her situation. Uh, and bear in mind, again, uh, she was and is uh, my client on this, so you may wish to discount uh, to some extent what I have to say, uh, but don't. Uh, 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 Judith Miller has just finished serving the longest term of uh, any journalist in American history uh, in jail. Indeed, not just the longest, but over twice as long uh, as any other journalist uh, has ever served. Uh, she was in jail for 85 days because uh, she was asked to reveal her source for a story she never wrote uh, uh, and uh, refused to do so based upon her view that having promised not to do so, she should not do so. Uh, and our legal position 
that her failure to do so was protected by the First Amendment. Uh, we have lost that First Amendment battle in this case. Uh, the Court of Appeals in Washington ruled uh, that Ms. Miller was obliged to testify in front of the grand jury and to respond to questions put to her by the grand jury. Uh, she refused to do so, and that is why uh, she was jailed. Um, about uh, two weeks ago, uh, she was released from jail. Uh, uh, shortly after her source, who has identified himself publicly, so I can, uh, 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 Scooter Libby, the chief of staff of Vice President Cheney, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Libby called her on the phone, uh, told her that they, not only did he have no objections to her speaking, but they wished her to testify. He also wrote her a letter, uh, and with that and the resolution of certain other outstanding matters, uh, she uh, agreed to testify and, and has done so. Uh, there has been a, a, a running exchange uh, in the press of the sort that makes a lawyer's look very good indeed uh, between myself uh, and Mr. Libby's uh, lawyer, uh, in which, uh, if you will excuse the expression, but it was published in Newsweek, he accused me of talking, quote, bullshit. That is the level of discussion uh, on which we, we deal with these issues. But what that was about, uh, was that about a year ago, uh, I spoke to his lawyer uh, before Judy Miller went to jail and asked uh, him essentially what, what Mr. Libby wanted of her. She had agreed to be silent, and I wanted to know what his views were. And he told me essentially two things. Uh, the, the two things sent to me a somewhat mixed message and that's why we're having these arguments in the press. He said, it's okay if she testifies. He also said, in response to my asking him, well, what about that waiver that he signed, a waiver form prepared by the Department of Justice and submitted to all high-ranking officials in the government, which basically uh, asked them to say, if I've asked any journalist to be silent, I take it back and I urge them to testify. I asked him, well, what about that form? Wasn't it coerced? He said, well, of course it was coerced. How could it not be coerced? He'd be fired if he didn't sign it. Uh, it's as coerced as his inability to take the Fifth Amendment. If he took the Fifth Amendment, he'd be fired. So effectively, He's not allowed to take the Fifth Amendment either. For Judy Miller, that raised a difficult question, because hers was not a legal issue of what is and what is not coercion and what is and what is not a waiver. For her, the question was, I promised to source confidentiality. What is the answer to the question that I can act on about whether he really wants me to talk or not? Because one of the problems in a situation like this, which makes it so subtle and difficult, is that when one lawyer, in, in the midst of a criminal investigation, asks another lawyer representing a client who may be the subject of the investigation, does your client want my client to talk or not? The answer has to be yes. Because if he says no, it is tantamount to obstruction of justice. So the problem with that is that to make the answer meaningful after the yes answer comes in and you follow it up and ask a little more, if the answers become blurry, or, or even if not on purpose blurry, uh, it's less than clear uh, what it is he wants. And in my view, at least, and Judy Miller's view, as time passed here and as she sat in jail and as, and as this man who she knew, this was no stranger, she was calling on the phone, never called her, 
never visited her, uh, never responded, even when Congressman Conyers of this state gave a speech on the floor of the House saying, Mr. Libby, why don't you give Judy Miller a personal waiver? Why don't you go see her, call her, write her, something? There was never any answer. And uh, our view was that either he didn't want her to talk or he wasn't prepared to take the final step of saying that she should. Well, finally that got resolved. Uh, a call was finally made, uh, and uh, she did uh, uh, testify uh, last week. Um, she is free. And the real question, <coughs> excuse me, I think is, uh, is this. What's the meaning of it all? What is the effect of all this on the law and maybe even more important on the underlying principle which journalists at their best are trying to defend when they assert confidentiality? That is to say, what is the effect on the willingness of people to talk to the press and trust the press to keep the, their promises of confidentiality. On the first, the law remains uncertain. In the District of Columbia, we, we have sustained a significant loss. The court has held that there is no protection, none, no balancing to be done at all uh, in a federal grand jury context when uh, a journalist is called upon to testify in front of a grand jury. The law is simply that journalists, like anyone else other than lawyers and priests and husbands and wives and those people that have a, quote, privilege, but in, in D.C. at least, the law is now clear that there is no confidential source protection at all in the federal grand jury context. In other places in the country, the law is to the contrary. In New York, where I live, in the Second Circuit, uh, uh, we are in the midst of a case also involving the same prosecutor and the same reporter. And in that case, we've won so far in strikingly similar circumstances. Uh, we've won uh, in a case in which uh, Mr. Fitzgerald is seeking to subpoena New York Times telephone records, uh, which happened to be Judy Miller's telephone records for another leak investigation he is uh, engaged in. Uh, and in that case, the federal court in New York has said uh, there is First Amendment protection for journalists, uh, and Mr. Fitzgerald has not shown that uh, he is entitled uh, to the uh, New York Times telephone records. Now, there are a lot of conclusions one could draw. Uh, my own view is that there are too many leak investigations going on, that of all the problems we have in the country, uh, leaks is not high uh, on the list, um, and that indeed uh, the, the visage of leak investigations may well be more uh, harmful than beneficial, even as to leaks of information which are not permitted uh, to be leaked. What is the, uh, what's the impact of it all? Are people less likely now to come to the press and tell them things that they want to get out, sometimes good things, sometimes bad, sometimes out of bad motives, sometimes good, sometimes things which serve the public, and sometimes not. We don't know. We just don't know. It's too early to know if the effect of all this will be to discourage uh, future leakers, uh, and again, not all leakers are high-ranking government officials uh, uh, who are uh, of a mind to try to hurt the reputation of someone criticizing someone in the government. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems here is that, as the executive editor of the New York Times put it, uh, we take our situations as we find them. Um, and uh, one of the realities here is that journalists don't know when they promise confidentiality, what they're about to hear. They don't know the answer to the question before they can hear the answer. 
And so if they once promise confidentiality, they have to keep their word even if what they hear uh, is uh, ignoble uh, or uh, unattractive. Um, so we will see uh, what the impact of this all is on the press uh, and, more important, on the public. And we will see, you will all see, in the next few weeks, uh, what the ultimate result is uh, uh, of the investigation uh, w which has been going on. Now, that said, uh, I did want to say what I came here to say, uh, duly shortened uh, for your benefit. Uh, and that's to talk a little bit about uh, some ongoing matters with respect to academic freedom and, indeed, what academic freedom uh, means. Uh, a few years ago, I heard a speech that uh, McGeorge Bundy gave about journalists and academics in which he said, to a journalist, the worst thing you can say is that your writing is academic. And to an academic, the worst you can say is that your writing is journalistic. Uh, words like that are sort of fun to play around with, uh, not only because, as Justice Holmes observed, uh, words are the skin of living thought, but because they can be used to mean so many different things. And so in this area, whose academic freedom uh, are we talking about? Uh, are we talking about what people have historically talked about, academic freedom of scholars, the academic freedom of the three people that we honor by being here today? Or are we also talking about the academic freedom of institutions vis-a-vis -vis the state? Or are we also talking about the academic freedom of students, if, if there is such a thing? Within the last two years, I found myself immersed in two issues uh, relating to academic freedom uh, in a very different context. Uh, one was the preparation of a brief uh, uh, amici curiae, a friend of the court, uh, submitted to the Supreme Court uh, in support uh, of this university uh, and its policies with respect to affirmative action. Uh, the brief we did was submitted on behalf of uh, Columbia University, Cornell, Georgetown, Rice, and Vanderbilt. And in it, we urged the Supreme Court to take close account of the First Amendment as well as the Fourteenth Amendment, the principles of free speech and academic freedom uh, uh, in determining whether this university's affirmative action programs passed constitutional muster. Now, the Supreme Court wound up doing that, although I must confess, giving no indication that our brief turned the tide, but nonetheless, uh, it did that. Our brief focused on the academic freedom interests of institutions, uh, in this case, the University of Michigan. Uh, I'll return to that for, for a moment, but again, it's worth saying at the start that the core notion of academic freedom has generally and generally correctly been viewed as relating to the rights of faculty members. From the time Stanford University dismissed a professor uh, in 1900 for having supported the candidacy of William Jennings Bryan in 1896, academics have generally rallied to the support of the principle that it is essential, as Lee Bollinger put it, that faculty members, not external actors, should determine professional standards for the academy. And our brief sought to offer a historical uh, justification for the expansion of that into the notion that even when individual faculty members are not at risk, that the university itself may be at risk if the government comes down too hard in telling the university how to teach and what to teach. I'll come back to that. The other matter I was involved in involved an internal investigation at Columbia University with respect to the claims of students that certain faculty members had intimidated them or sought to do so 
because of their political views. The issue, as you may recall, arose when a number of Jewish students complained that certain faculty members in the Middle East and Asian Languages and Culture Department in Columbia had not only taught courses that the students believed to be biased and sometimes factually incorrect, but had engaged in inappropriate criticism and even ridicule of students because their views of the Middle East were not the same of those of the, their politically engaged faculty members. Uh, I served as the advisor to the committee appointed to look into that matter. Let me start with the, with the Michigan situation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Michigan case as such, but just to offer at the outset a few historical thoughts about the academic freedom rights of universities themselves. And I begin with a case that throughout the years has been, become more famous for one observation of counsel, Daniel Webster, no less, in his oral argument than anything the Supreme Court had to say. It was, of course, the Dartmouth College case decided by the Supreme Court in 1819. Webster's remark, how I wish I could come up with something like this when I argue in the Supreme Court, was to say of Dartmouth that it was a small college, but there are those of us that love it. I can imagine trying that in front of Justice Scalia today. <laughs> but he said it, and indeed he repeated it uh, in, in his argument. The Dartmouth College case is sort of interesting. As you look back almost 200 years, it arose out of heated debates between the president of the college and college trustees over the appointment of the professor of divinity, the students' attendance obligations at chapel and local churches, and the divinity professor's services to neighboring congregations. When the trustees, in an effort to protect, as they viewed it, the religious character of the college, dismissed the president, the New Hampshire legislature responded by altering the charter of the college to add new members of the board, to add a new entity with the power to veto determinations of the trustees, and to make the president and trustees accountable to the governor and the state council. The New Hampshire Supreme Court upheld the law. Chief Justice Richardson said that he could, quote, not bring himself to believe that it would be consistent with sound public policy or ultimately with the true interest of literature itself to place the great public institutions in which all the young men destined for the liberal professions are to be educated within the absolute control of a few individuals and out of the control of the sovereign power. Truly independent trustees, he wrote, would ultimately forget that their office was a public trust. That opinion was written at a time when, as one scholar has observed, state after state, in Virginia, Massachusetts, to New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and of course New Hampshire, legislative threats to or attacks on colleges had produced at least stagnation in and often serious injury to the institutions. When the Dartmouth College case reached the Supreme Court, it reversed, holding that the charter of the college could not be overcome and that a private college could not be required to serve the state's end of advancing, quote, perfect freedom of religion. As phrased by Chief Justice Marshall, that education is an object of national concern and a proper subject of legislation, all admit that there may be an institution founded by government and placed entirely under its immediate control, the officers of which would be public officers, amenable exclusively to the government, none will deny. But is Dartmouth such an institution? Is education altogether in the hands of government? Does every teacher become a public officer and do donations for the, public, for the purpose of education necessarily become public property so that the will of the legislature becomes the law of the donation? Answering those questions in the negative and holding that a college charter of a private university 
was one protected by the Constitution, the Court's opinion encouraged the development of private colleges by protecting them from state interference. And that development of private colleges later came to lead to greater freedom even in publicly funded institutions such as this one. The Dartmouth College case, one scholar observed, became the Magna Carta of the American system of higher education. And in the years that followed, there was very little conflict in the courts between government and private universities. There was little or no federal support. There was no government-imposed duties. And at the same time, as one person put it, the general physical isolation of the college or university set in a rural college town and behind the traditional college gate reflected the more general removal of scholarly and student life from the interest or control from society at large. Only in 1952 did the words academic freedom first appear in a judicial opinion of the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and there, Justice Douglas concluded in a dissenting opinion that a New York McCarthy-like statute called the Feinberg Law, which barred from employment in the public schools any member of an organization declared by the state's Board of Regents to, to favor the overthrow of the government by force or violence, Douglas argued that the New York law with its, quote, system of spying and surveillance cannot go hand in hand with academic freedom and that there can be no real academic freedom in that environment. There were other cases in the future. The most striking and the one I would like to urge on you to remember perhaps the most is a case also in the 1950s in which a plurality of the U.S. Supreme Court identified academic freedom <coughs> as a core constitutional interest. And a concurring opinion of two members of the court, Justice Frankfurter and Justice Harlan, memorably identified the central role of academic freedom in a free society. Again, the reason we meet here today comes to mind when we hear the facts of that case, a case which arose out of an investigation by the Attorney General of New Hampshire about lectures conducted at the University of New Hampshire by a Professor Sweezy. After he declined to respond to certain questions, the Attorney General sought to compel the testimony. The uh, plurality opinion of the Supreme Court of Justice Brennan, ruling in favor of the professors, focused on the essentiality of freedom in the community of American universities and the violation of that freedom occasioned by compelled disclosure of the substance of the professor's lectures. Justice Frankfurter's concurring opinion has been quoted for over half a century. It warned of the grave harm resulting from government intrusion into the intellectual life of a university and the need for First Amendment protection against it. And it quoted in its most celebrated portion from a, a then recent statement written on behalf of two open universities in apartheid ruled South Africa, the University of Cape Town and the University of Itzvanistrand universities that accepted non-white as well as white students at a time when apartheid was ruthlessly in effect. The statement urged that legislative enactment of academic segregation on racial grounds is an unwarranted interference with university autonomy and academic freedom. And in the portion of the statement from South Africa, quoted in Justice Frankfurter's opinion, and now much quoted thereafter. It said, it is the business of a university to provide that atmosphere which is most conducive to speculation, experiment, and creation. It is an atmosphere in which there prevail the four essential freedoms of a university, 
to determine for itself on academic grounds who may teach, what may be taught, how it shall be taught, and who may be admitted to study. That material, that quotation, was quoted again in the determining Supreme Court opinion in the Bakke case in 1978 uh, and uh, cited again uh, in the University of Michigan case uh, by Justice O'Connor. It remains uh, one of the great and enduring statements of the essentiality of freedom of university from state control uh, um, as regards the Columbia uh, investigation, as you may recall, a number of Jewish students complained about the fact that they, uh, according to them, that certain faculty members had comported themselves in a manner which was inconsistent with the notion of a civil and tolerant learning environment. The question put to the university after years in which, for lack of a reasonable grievance procedure, none of the students knew where to go and none of the people they went to wanted to hear them, even to look into it. With the appointment, finally, of this committee, the first question was what to look to to determine the very delicate issue of what obligations are to be imposed upon faculty members, or to put it differently, what academic freedom-like rights students have in circumstances in which they believe that they are being effectively not just taught but intellectually harassed, something which, as you can immediately see, can vary according to who's doing the determination. Columbia looked the, the panel to its own faculty handbook, which had language saying that the university was committed to maintaining a climate <coughs> of academic freedom um, in which all officers of instructions and research are given the widest possible latitude in their teaching and scholarship, but which then said that the, among the responsibilities of the faculty was not only to meet scheduled classes, to hold office hours, and the like, but that in conducting their classes, Faculty should make every effort to be accurate and should show respect for the rights of others to hold opinions differing from their own. Um, another document said, uh, the, the freedom traditionally accorded to members of the faculty to decide for themselves in large measure what they teach imposes a correlative obligation of responsible self-discipline. Every effort must therefore be made to be accurate, objective, to demonstrate appropriate restraint, and to show respect for the opinions of others. The AAUP had similar language in a variety of its statements. How is that applied? One student complained that in a spring 2002 class, at the time of the Israeli incursion, into the West Bank village of Janine. Her professor, quote, was discussing the Israeli incursion into the West Bank and Gaza. She said, <coughs> I do not remember exactly what he was saying. I raised my hand and asked if it was true that Israel sometimes gives warning before bombing certain areas and buildings so that the people could get out and no one would get hurt. At this, the professor blew up, yelling, if you're going to deny the atrocities being committed against Palestinians, then you can get out of my classroom. I don't recall exactly how I responded, except by saying I'm not denying anything. But I was so shocked by his reaction that I don't think I said anything more than that. The professor did not throw the student out of the classroom, and it was agreed that the professor did not take account of this incident in any grading. Two students corroborated the main elements of the account that I've read to you. The professor denied it, saying I would never ask a student to leave my class. Uh, and three other people who testified said they did not recall such an episode. After extensive deliberations, a faculty panel appointed 
by the president and vice president of the university, found it credible that the professor had become, quote, angered at a question that he understood to countenance Israeli conduct of which he disapproved and that he had responded heatedly. The response the committee found exceeded commonly accepted bounds and was not consistent with the obligation, quote, to show respect for the rights of others, to hold opinions differing from their own, and to exercise responsible self-discipline and to demonstrate appropriate restraint. Another allegation that was brought against the same professor by a different student was one in which the student claimed, you know, reported, that he atten attended a lecture by the professor about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, which was given off campus, about half a block off the Columbia campus uh, in New York. Uh, the student was a, uh, a student in the general studies department in the first year. He was Israeli uh, and had served in the Israeli armed forces. He said, quote, I raised my hand to ask a question when he was finished and presented myself as an Israeli student. The professor in his response asked me whether I served in the Israeli military, <coughs> to which I responded that I had been a soldier. Then to my surprise, he asked me, well, if you served in the military, why don't you tell us how many Palestinians have you killed? I replied by saying I did not see the relevance of that, but the professor aghast me again, how many Palestinians have you killed? I did not answer and remained silent. A few minutes later, as my frustration grew, I decided to show him how absurd was his response. I raised my hand and asked him how many members of his family celebrated on September 11. He was very naturally very upset for my question, and the discussion was ended. Another student confirmed the discussion, and it was contemporaneously reported to a dean. The faculty member stated he had no recollection of it and urged that since it had not occurred on campus, it should not have been looked into by the committee in the first place. Once again, the committee found that it was credible to conclude that an exchange of this nature had occurred at a location adjacent to the campus. It concluded that such a statement would not have been acceptable in a classroom, but that it might well be acceptable in an off-campus political event where it might fall within a not unfamiliar range of give and take regarding charged issues. These were the only two incidents brought to the attention of the committee in which they determined that a faculty member had behaved actually or potentially inappropriately. By far the larger number of complaints related not to what could fairly be described as intimidation or the like, but to the area of alleged bias. And it is that that I will conclude with uh, talking about. It seems to me that there is a significant difference between having a university investigation about charges made by students of uh, professorial intimidation or the like, those two examples I cited to you, situations in which I think it was appropriate for the university to look into it and to, uh, and again, in the absence of a grievance procedure which now exists but did not exist in a meaningful manner at Columbia then, uh, to appoint, if necessary, a special panel to look into it. But what to make of the other charges? What to make of Charges the students made that one professor uh, said uh, falsely that the Israeli athletes killed in, in the Munich Olympics were killed by Israeli sharpshooters. What to make of the charge that uh, uh, one professor only used the word Israel with the word racist as an immediate modifier to the word uh, Israel uh, itself. My own view, after thinking about this a lot, um, is that any solution of the problem occasioned by charges of bias 
which involves the establishment of panels to investigate professorial conduct in class would do significantly more harm to First Amendment values than any benefit that could possibly come by catching some examples of what one might call uh, biased uh, teaching. I think back to a professor that I had at Cornell as an undergraduate in a course I took uh, called The Age of Washington. The professor was a great scholar uh, about Washington and deeply, probably in an overwrought manner, committed to the Washingtonian rather than English side around the time of the revolution. He was a professor who refused to teach in the history building at Cornell, which was named Goldwyn Smith Hall, because Goldwyn Smith was an English scholar who had written a book called The American Rebellion. And his worst sin was that he gave me a D minus on a brilliant paper, I assure you that I wrote as a very young undergraduate about John Dickerson, in which I made the mistake of speaking well of Canada. Uh, 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 <laughs> something my professor found appalling. Uh, uh, I went to my advisor. We had a system then at Cornell where everyone was assigned an advisor. Looking back now, he was probably about 12 years old. He was very young. Uh, and he said to me, I can get you out of the class. I showed him the paper. It was marked up. I mean, everything was circled. It was awful. I haven't recovered yet, as you can tell. Uh, it's only 50 blank years. Um, he said, I can get you out of the class. He said, I can't change your grade. Uh, uh, and I thought often about, about him uh, and about other situations uh, in which claims have been made, sometimes accurately made, that this professor or that professor has gone too far uh, in one direction or another, uh, leans too much in this political direction or another. I should tell you that at Columbia, the students uh, who complained most uh, in, in a list of the amount of complaints filed after the, the Jewish students who made the complaints that I was adverting to a moment ago. Uh, second were black students who objected to the omission of certain material from coursework. And third were Republicans uh, who complained about the inclusion of jokes about President Bush in mathematics classes. Uh, and and others where you, you might think it is not the most relevant uh, uh, thing to be confronted with at 8 in the morning. Um, but it, it seems to me that, that the price is too great to start down the road, uh, certainly of having legislation, which, which, as you know, some people have proposed, legislation embodying uh, students' Bill of Rights uh, uh, and uh, uh, even outside the legislative uh, framework. It's important. It's very important for a university to try to take steps to make sure that its students get a good education which includes access to a wide range of views and that students uh, certainly uh, not be uh, ridiculed or demeaned because they say things that are inconsistent uh, with their uh, faculty members' uh, views, particularly in areas uh, which are public policy uh, filled areas. But when I read some of the proposals for an academic Bill of Rights, proposals now pending in 19 states, uh, ostensibly drafted to protect student rights, it seems to me that having a decent grievance procedure on campus uh, is far better. Well, one, one professor summarized these proposals as follows, as calling upon 
an inquiry, especially if a state legislature passes it, an inquiry backed by the coercive power of the state, which would put the department or school into intellectual receivership. In practice, courts would either protect points of views with which they were sympathetic, or more likely, protect all arguable, respectable points of views, the judicial attitude most consistent with general First Amendment values. It would, he argues, represent the final dispatch of the scientific research and humanistic values uh, of a university. It is crucial to academic discourse that new speech be critically met and those who fail to satisfy a reasonable standard be excluded. One of the most troubling provisions in these academic Bill of Rights is one which basically says that anything is, which is an unsettled question should lead a professor to have the duty to teach alternative views since, quote, teachers should consider and make their students aware of other viewpoints and to the spectrum of significant dissenting scholarly viewpoints. On one level, that makes a lot of sense, and sure, it's a good idea. But the idea of imposing on professors the notion that of deciding first what is settled and what is unsettled, and then obliging them to teach anything that they view or that someone else views as unsettled, consider evolution and the ongoing debate about whether intelligent design is or is not scientifically uh, rooted uh, at all. What of a biology professor who believes that evolution is settled and doesn't want to teach intelligent design as part of the course? Uh, the very notion of having legislation which could be enforced by courts, let alone a constant stream of hearings about issues like this, seems to me uh, unacceptable. In the end, uh, I offer you a final view. The First Amendment is based on the notion that, that we take a lot of risks in what people say. Speech does harm sometimes. Speech does cause social harm. Uh, speech wounds sometimes. Uh, speech sometimes can lead to national security harm. And yet, at our best, we proceed on the notion that we almost invariably take the risks of the harm of speech for the benefits that speech brings us and to avoid the dangers of government control uh, of speech. And so on a university campus as well. Uh, when we talk about academic freedom, we're talking about taking some chances. When you have freedom, you have the potential of abuse of freedom. But if your fear of abuse of freedom is so great as to require the installation of legislative uh, schemes such as have been proposed or judicial intervention with respect to what occurs on a campus, uh, we will lose uh, a lot more than we will gain in precisely the same way. We will lose all the benefits of the freedom of scholars to have their say, even if they insist on a political joke or two as they go about their business. Thank you all very much. Are you familiar with the Denver 3 case out of Denver? Uh, no. Abrams? Okay. Sorry. Well, I, I had a question with respect to, um, it looks like apparently the Bush administration is using re uh, Republican staffers to remove people from events that are open to the public, and I wondered if you thought that there was a First Amendment issue there. Is there enough state action if they rely on volunteers to do that? 
Yeah, the question, is, as you've heard, is uh, uh, when the administration removes, as they have, people from what are essentially public events uh, uh, because of this, what are nothing more than political reasons, uh, uh, is there enough state action there uh, to uh, warrant a First Amendment challenge to it? Uh, I happen to think there is. Uh, um, I don't know if the courts would agree, but it does seem to me that uh, it's almost a paradigmatic example of state action when, when uh, a security people attached to the president, even, even if they're attached to a political party as well, but, but you know, the president of the United States in a public place, uh, keeping people out, uh, because of their uh, p political viewpoint um, and not on the basis of any showing of any security uh, threat at all, it does seem to me that that raises a, a genuine uh, First Amendment problem which could be uh, cognizable in a case. Next question. I have a question regarding uh, anonymous sourcing, and I know it's important uh, for the press. But uh, actually, it's a two-part question. And the first part is, does a reporter have a right and or obligation to protect an anonymous source who has used the reporter to spread disinformation or lies? And also, I was wondering if uh, there's the possibility of using uh, conspiracy laws against any government officials and news organizations if they knowingly disseminate disinformation and lies that result in an incitement of uh, an illegal act. In an incitement of what? In il illegal acts. Oh, right. uh, I think it's uh, uh, very unlikely that um, that the conspiracy laws can be used, and it would be, in my view, a mistake for them to be used uh, on a, a theory as broad as, as you've outlined in terms of uh, you know, conspiracy to lead people to engage in uh, illegal conduct. That, that, I mean, there are some cases, obviously, when I mean, Communist Party leaders went to jail uh, on a conspiracy theory uh, of that sort. But that was not what we consider a great civil liberties victory uh, in this country. Um, and I think it's really important for us to bear in mind that we really have to make law and apply law uh, for all administrations. That uh, whatever uh, we may think of this administration or some things they've done, uh, any, anything we want done about the law, uh, we have to be ready to apply uh, across the board. Now, as regards the question of, of whether a promise of confidentiality survives in a situation in which the source has provided false information, uh, or, and I want to add for purposes of the question, uh, information that uh, he may have obtained illegally or provided illegally, uh, I would say that it, that it does apply. Uh, at least morally, uh, uh, I, th I think it applies. I think once the promise is made, uh, it should be kept. Um, uh, I can tell you, having testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, that a number of people on that committee looking into the question of whether we should have a federal shield law are troubled by the notion of protecting speech which wasn't supposed to be made in the first place. That is to say, leaks of information which by its nature was uh, perhaps illegal for this source to reveal. For me, though, that takes me back to the Pentagon Papers. That is precisely what happened there when Daniel Ellsberg provided information to the New York Times, uh, information for, uh, the, the providing of which later led to his indictment, which, which finally was uh, quashed or his criminal case because of the government misconduct involving him. But, but put that aside, would we want the law to be 
one which uh, allows uh, prosecution uh, in those uh, circumstances. More, more relevant to your question, would, would we want the journalists to conclude that if they determined that the information they were getting was information their source was not allowed to give them, should they say, in effect, I can't promise confidentiality in that case, or I won't keep my promise of confidentiality. Most things in the government that are worth knowing are classified. Uh, that's all the good stuff. Um, and, and lots that is classified is not harmful to national security either. Um, one of my great concerns about a recent trend of this administration and the Department of Justice is the assertion of some very broad theories upon which prosecutions could be based uh, with respect to the revelation of information because it is classified. And I'm especially troubled by, by that because President Clinton vetoed a bill uh, towards the very end of his administration which would have made it a crime to reveal any classified information. Uh, and Congress did not uh, overturn that or seek to overturn that. This was something he vetoed in the very last days of the administration. So, I mean, it's not a crime on the face of it to leak classified information unless it meets certain very specific requirements. Atomic energy is one, uh, for example. So I'd be loath to, to uh, go along with either, either of the uh, suggestions uh, in your question. I would say that I am interested as I follow the current investigation in what sort of charges could be brought. And as I suggested in the talk I gave at the law school earlier, it is conceivable, if charges are brought, that the special prosecutor will at least look at the question of whether he could charge some leakers uh, with conspiring to deprive Wilson of his constitutional rights. Uh, that is to say, by engaging in the leaking, have they uh, uh, participated in some sort of conspiracy to, to deprive him of his constitutional right, his First Amendment right to criticize the president? Uh, that, too, would raise interesting First Amendment issues. Uh, but uh, as I wait to see what, what is done, I'll, that's one of the things I'm interested in. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I have more of a, a philosophical question, maybe. I mean, um, the, the First Amendment seems to be based on this notion that the good information chases out the bad, that uh, if you open the community up to all points of view, that the truth will somehow beat out the falsehood. Um, and, I mean, recently it just seems that, uh, especially in the lead-up to the Iraq war, that didn't happen. Um, the media got it spectacularly wrong, and I'm a member of the media, and I reported on Iraq, and so I'm speaking about my own here. Um, but in this case, um, the issue was not government interference or uh, direct interference in the media. It was intimidation, but by other media or maybe something... It, uh, I'm not even sure exactly what happened, but I just know that, that the, um, something broke in, our, in, in the way the media was supposed to function in, in the United States. Is there any third alternative, then, um, to opening the, the, the space up to, to all points of view uh, and to regulating it? I don't, uh, I'm not idealistic enough uh, to really think that uh, good information always or maybe even mostly drives out bad information. Um, my own First Amendment view is rooted much more in the notion that the harm that government has done around the world, and occasionally in this country too, in suppressing speech uh, makes it such a danger to start down the road uh, of allowing 
uh, speech to be limited because it can do some harm, uh, that I'm not prepared to even start there. So uh, uh, when you ask, you know, if there's sort of a, a third a third way uh, to to deal with the problem, the problem I take it is the press sometimes gets really important things wrong. Yeah. It's not just that they focus on trivia a lot, which they do, um, but but it is that even when they focus on what really matters, they're sometimes terribly wrong. I believe that is uh, simply the price of living in a free society, and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to start thinking of uh, alternatives uh, in in terms of uh, limiting uh, limiting the flow of information. Uh, I mean, you're 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 quite right, I think, in saying that some of the coverage, some of the worst coverage, at least, was directly and badly affected by what other journalistic organizations uh, were doing, or I would phrase it in an even more a concerned way, some of the bad coverage came from the press giving the public what it thought the public wanted, um, uh, and that the public either, you know, maybe did, maybe didn't want. Um, it seems to me that that uh, it's just not a close question uh, about what direction to go in. I mean, we've we've really. Uh, Learned Hand said, you know, we've, we've made a bet on the notion that, that uh, our salvation, if there is any, is more likely th through the dissemination of more information rather than less. And when we say that, we have to mean that sometimes uh, it will work badly, and sometimes it does. Let's just take two more questions. Yes. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay, thank you so much. Sure.